So far, we've only really been looking at what happens when we've got indices that are whole values, or what we call integer values. But indices can actually exist as fractions as well, and we call these rational indices. So, for example, I want you to consider what would happen if we had a value of some kind that had an indice of 1 over 2. And we're going to just explore this for a moment about what the denominator part of our indice actually means. So when we're looking at this, this denominator part of our indice actually refers to what root that we need to find of our base value. So what this says is I need to find the second root of my a value. But we say that is the square root of our a value. Now, because this top value is a 1, we're just finding the square root of the a value. We'll discuss the numerator in a moment. Now, if we consider what happens when we change this denominator to 3, what that essentially now means is we need to find the third root of our a value, or what number times itself three times will find our base value. So what that means is we're essentially finding what's known as the cube root, or the third root, of our a value. Now if we keep extending this, and we had a to the power of one fourth, that denominator now is telling us that we need to find the fourth root of our base value, or the a value. So we write this as this fourth root of our base value. So what I can do is I can generalize this to say that if I've got a base value that has an indice that is a fraction of 1 over n, n just being any number as our denominator, what this is the equivalent of is finding the nth root of our base value of a. Now that's all well and good if we've got a numerator value that's 1, but what happens if our numerator value isn't 1? Well, to answer that question, I want you to consider this for, for a moment. What if we had a number that had the power of 2 over 1? Now we know that the denominator here tells us to find the nth root of whatever base value we've got. But our denominator is 1, which tells us to find the first root of it. And the first root of it is just the value that we've got. So essentially, when we've got a denominator of 1, we're actually not doing anything in terms of this nth root sort of value. But I want you to consider this. 2 divided by 1 is just going to leave a whole value of 2. So it's a to the power of 2, which we know means that we need to take the base value and multiply it by itself twice. So any time that we've got an integer indice, our denominator is actually 1. So what that means is we've essentially been dealing with these types of problems for some time. But what I want to do is have a look at this following problem. What if I had a number that had an indice of 5 over 3? Well, we know the denominator tells us that we need to find the cube root, or the third root of our base. So we're finding the third root of it. But the numerator tells us that we actually need to multiply this base value by itself however many times that value is. In this case, it's 5 times. So we actually need to do that as our first step. We need to go, what is our base value multiplied by itself 5 times, then we find the third root of it. If we had this value of a to the power of 5 over 4, equally this denominator value tells us that we need to find the fourth root of this, which we write as this, but the numerator tells us that we need to multiply the base value of a by itself 5 times. So when I look at this, I can see through this patterning that we come up with this special generalized rule, that if we have a base value that's to the power of m over n, the m value tells us how many times we must multiply that base by itself, and the n value tells us what root we need to find of that value. But what I want to do now is I want to look at some generalized situations, some simple situations where we can sort of apply this sort of logic. And to do that, I want to simplify some problems that we can rewrite with just the base value of 2. And we're going to start with the cube root of 2 to the fifth power. Now if we were to rewrite this, we know that our base value is already in 2, so we can keep our base of 2. But this 5 value is the numerator of our rational index. So this will be 2 to the power of 5 over the nth root, which is the third root in this situation. So it will be 2 to the power of 5 over 3. But what if I want to rewrite this sort of problem 
the fourth root of eight. And I wanna rewrite this so it has a base value of two. Well, at the moment here, our base value is eight. So we first need to rewrite this value with a base value of two. Now, if we were to do that, I know that eight is the equivalent of two to the power of three. And what we've now got here is a very similar problem to what we had over here, where I can rewrite this as the base value of two, our numerator is gonna be this three, and our denominator is gonna be the fourth root. So when we rewrite this with a base value of two, this is the equivalent of two to the power of three over four. But let's take a look at just one more situation. What if I had one over the square root of two? Well, this is a situation where once again, I'm probably gonna need a couple of steps. I first of all, because I've got a base value of two already, I need to rewrite this so it doesn't have the cert. So this is the equivalent of one over two to the power of a half. But this is still a fraction. I haven't just got this as a base of two. So I need to use my understanding of negative index laws and bring this whole value to the top by multiplying this index by negative one. So this is the equivalent to two to the power of negative one over two. So to summarize, our rational sort of indice where we've got a number to the power of a fraction, the numerator of that fraction tells us how many times we need to multiply that number by itself. And our denominator of that fraction tells us what root we need to find of that value.